Welcome home. This is the Irish Roots Cafe where every day's a holiday and there's always room for one more. We've made it to the 101st week, folks. Come right this way. Have a seat with me today in the corner booth celebrating. Swinny, clear that floor. Katie, bar that door again. Molly, put on another pot of Irish coffee. Or that is that a little tea today? I can't quite tell. It's a little brisk. Well, it's time we get this show on the road. We've got another full house today. Not a chair to spare. Well, among today's topics, Kitson is the Irish family name of the day. The Irish Book of Arms is the video of the week. Penner's Survey of Ireland is the book of the month. Guess who's got named the airline of the year? Uh, the Irish government sat for the first time 90 years ago. And what else did that signify? Hey, and the search for Keen and O'Shaughnessy and Sheehan and Kavanaugh and McSweeney. At number seven, what if there were no famine in Ireland cir circa 1847 and what are we doing today to prevent the same thing from happening? And number eight, hey, we, today we've got a history note from Mick, and it's all about who were the wild geese. So it's a good one today. Hang in there. And that reminds me to tell you, we've got five free broadcasts out there. Now, some of the early broadcasts of, uh, of this Irish Roots Cafe, uh, Genealogy and History, are in the members section after a couple of years or 12 months or so. We archive them to make room for the uh, fresh stuff. But uh, other than that, all five uh, broadcasts are available online free to everybody. And that includes an enhanced version of this podcast you're listening to right now that has pictures on it. You can click on those pictures and it'll take you to some live links. And our Irish in America podcast and our Irish song podcast and the uh, Irish Roots Cafe videos, too. We've got the videos going on now, so that's been every week for a couple of months now, I think. Uh, so there's just all kinds of things going on. I want to make sure you knew about them. Well, let's take a look at a couple of notes we might have this week. Well, number one, the big news for Irish family researchers uh, uh, this week is that birth, marriage, and death records for Ireland for the years 1845 to 1958, they've been uploaded, or should I say the indexes for the statutory registration records have been uploaded, and uh, later there may be some more on that, but that's how they're starting it off. And if you, if you remember, the statutory re registration for Protestants began in 1845, and for Catholic, it's, Catholics it began in 1864. Now, service on this new web uh, <clears throat> service spot has been a little uh, iffy now and then, but that's because it's just getting up there, and boy, we sure understand what that's all about. But it's well worth checking that out. And it's currently available at the Family Search Pilot site, and I've got that link uh, on the blog. Uh, oh, it's a long one, so you just have to go to the blog, or if you're li listening to the enhanced version, I'll put a link to that site on the uh, enhanced version uh, link there so you can click right on it. Uh, number two, let me see. I got a note here and it says, uh, Hi Mike, I was on your website today and found a letter from Ian Finn who is a new member. I would like to get in touch with him as I have a Dennis Finn born circa 1767, County Carlow, Ireland. Well, uh, okay, we'll include your address on the blog there and uh, yeah, anytime you see somebody in here or one of the members I announce is looking for somebody, uh, let me know and I'll get you in touch. I'll get, I'll get a hold of the member and give them your address and uh, they can email you right back if you like. Uh, number three, now who were those wild geese of Ireland? Well, Mick is dropping by here. He's just now sitting down in the booth. How you doing there, Mick? And he's going to give us a report on his research into that little topic. I've heard so many stories over the last 20 years, it's hard to know where to start and stop. Uh, but here, okay, let's, let's get that get that other microphone set up over there and uh, listen in right now to our interview, and I'll have uh, notes on the blog, of course, about it. But uh, let's take a listen here and uh, talk with Mike. And now it's time for our Irish history segment with uh, Mick is going to have that. It's sort of like an Ask Mick session we're going to have uh, 
in this podcast. We might do a few more later. And you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, I've heard people mention terms like the wild geese and the wild geese of Ireland. And I always wondered, at least back in the beginning, what that really was. And I thought, well, let's have somebody uh, take a look into that question and answer it for us. I heard people say things like, well, uh, they used to write on passenger manifests, uh, uh, 16 cartons of wild geese for uh, a bunch of Irishmen they were smuggling out of the country. And I heard other people say, well, they just looked overhead and they remembered all the people that left Ireland in, in, in bad times. And one day they will all return again in the skies like flocks of great geese coming back to reconquer Ireland. And uh, I guess now it might be time to get some of the real facts. Uh, Mick, how you doing today? Pretty good, Mike. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. Uh, uh, do you think you can uh, take a stab at this question now? Uh, give it a shot. By the way, this is a pretty good cup of tea you have here. Ah, uh, good. Hey, it's nothing. It's the Irish Roots Cafe tea, and Molly oh. mixed that up special. You see her back there in the corner? I do. Ah, uh, I take it. Normally, it's it's Irish coffee she'd be making this time of day. Really? Yeah, but for I told you you were coming, and she says, oh, it'll be t- tea then. Now, well, I've it? noticed the tea has a slight flavor of whiskey. Uh, Irish whiskey would that, be. Would that be correct? It would not be my fault. No? It would be Molly who did it. Well, yet. I kind of like it. Ah, good, good. So there you go. Now, what about, what is the meaning of the wild geese? Well, Mike, it's a term used in Irish history to refer to soldiers who left to serve in European armies in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. And believe it or not, in the British armies as late as the First World War. And to give you some more info on that, the first troops to serve as a unit for the Continental Power formed an Irish regiment in the Spanish Army of Flanders in the 80-year war in the 1580s. This regiment had been raised by an English Catholic named William Stanley in Ireland from native Irish soldiers and mercenaries whom the English authorities wanted out of the country, of course, you know, didn't want another rebellion there, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, now, now that actually takes us back to before the uh, the time of the flight of the Earls, the 1580s. So now let's move up to the uh, what they call the flight of the Earls, which is another famous term that you hear thrown around an awful lot. What is that? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people get that confused. Uh, flight of the Wild Geese, flight of the Earls. Well, the flight of the Earls occurred, occurred in uh, 1607 with the defeat of the rebels of the Nine Year War. And those guys were the Earl of Tyrone, Hugh O'Neill, the Earl of Tyrconnell, Rory O'Donnell, and the Lord of Bantry, Donald O'Sullivan. Good Irish names, of course. Oh, yes. Along with those guys were many chiefs and their followers from Ulster, and they all fled Ireland. You have to get Spanish help in order to restart the rebellion in Ireland. But the King of Spain, Philip III, did not want the re- resumption of war with England and refused the request. Oh, that's sort of like uh, what the... Uh uh, the Spanish did at the uh, Treaty of Limerick just before, after they had signed the treaty, they showed up and said, okay, now we're ready to fight. But the Irish guy said, no, it's too late. We've already signed the treaty. And so the Irish got left out in the cold. As usual, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We see a pattern here. <laughs> we do. <laughs> they don't make it easy for them. Yeah, pretty sad, all right. And it just goes on and on. And let's see, from the mid-17th century, France overtook Spain as the destination for these Irish guys seeking a military career. The principal reason, I believe, was France was an ascendant power, rapidly expanding its armed forces, whereas Spain was a power in decline. Now, does that sound familiar? Well, it does. And you know what? You're going to see a lot of strange names in France and Spain. You look over there, you'll see like uh, Euler is is a name that used to be O'Leary, and it goes into to France. There's even a street called, uh, uh, I think it is Rue de Euler. And so it's a, cha- a name change, which you might even not know that was an Irish guy. No, you wouldn't. A lot of people don't. It's yeah. fascinating. And even, uh, believe it or not, in Austria, there was a pretty famous guy, Peter Lacey. He became the field marshal, and his son, Franz Moritz von Lacey. Von Lacey. Excelled in the Austrian service. Yeah, can you believe that? Oh, well, so if, if you got a von before your name, it might be as good as a Mac or an O sometimes. It, pretty much that's the way it worked in Austria, yeah. Ah, uh-huh. be doggone. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And here's another funny uh, little thing of interest. The Irish regiments earned more than their French counterparts, and they wore the red coat of the British Army. Oh, they dressed in red coats. Yes. You thought it might have been green, but that's not the case. Not the case. A lot of people didn't know that. Well, you know, I remember there was a book called Irish Knights of Spanish... No, Spanish Knights of Irish Origins, and it was all about the Irish nobility who came over to Spain and served in the armed forces and in top levels of the government, and this book traced the genealogy of all these 
Spanish families back to Ireland. So that's going to be important to anybody researching their family history in that area of the world. That would be very important. By the way, Mike, could I have some more tea? Uh, sure. Molly, get right over here now, will you? Oh, here she comes. Yeah, a little bit stronger. There we yeah, go. Yeah. That's that's perfect. Those are dangerous words, you know. Not too much whiskey there. Now. Ah, okay. gee. Yes, Mike, this really is interesting stuff. And um, the end of the wild geese, um, of course, has a lot to do with the British. This would have been around the year, year of uh, 1745. So Charles Wogan indicated in a letter to Dean Swift that 120,000 Irishmen had been killed and wounded in foreign service within these 40 years. 120,000, that's a lot of people. Well, but for a little island, island like Ireland. Yeah. Fascinating. So it was about this time the British began to tap into the Irish Catholic manpower. In the late 18th century, the penal law was gradually relaxed. In the 1790s, the laws prohibiting Catholics bearing arms was abolished. Therefore, the British began recruiting Irish regiments for the Crown Forces, God help us, huh? including such famous units as the Connacht Rangers. And here's some fascinating information. 1830, 42% of the British Army was Irish. So you're going to, you know that, you know what that means to family researchers? Yes. That means that they can go into the British records and maybe find some information about their family members who were in the British Army. Yes, they possibly could because uh-huh. only 41% were English, 42% were Irish. That's can amazing. You, can you believe that? How, how come they did, just didn't raise a big thing and come over and, and uh, uh, free Ireland at that time? Well, I'm sure they thought about it, but um, it just wasn't going to happen at that at that stage. I think you're right. It just wasn't in the car. It wasn't meant to be at that time. No, it wasn't. And remember, this was 1830. This is uh, shortly before the famine, too. Now, does this sort of mark the end of the wild geese? Pretty much does, yeah. Things changed rapidly after that, and that's another story. Of course, we can get into the wild geese, as you would call them, in America. Oh, that's right. You know, uh, well, South America, there was uh, Bernardo O'Higgins, I think. He was known as the Liberator. And, uh, gosh, in America, you know, they they said they had stories. They say a, a fella gets off the boat from Ireland, and he walks out there, and a guy slaps him on the back and says, oh, three meals a day, and you get to see the West all for free. And you just sign right on this dotted line. And they did it. And what happened then? Well, it wasn't quite as they expected. A lot of these guys, like you say, just got off the boat straight into the army, thought they were going to get some good wages, be fed, etc., and maybe even get some land. And as it turned out, they were treated really very badly by the officers, mainly the Irish, but not only. It was also some Catholic Germans, Scottish, and some others. So to make a long story short, they, uh, this was in the, the Mexican-American War. They decided, seeing as they're being treated so badly by the American officers, but why not go and fight with the Mexicans who are also cattle? Uh, okay. I've heard stories about yeah. that. And they were getting a bad deal. So some people say they were traitors. Some said they were heroes. It depends on your point of view right there. But they actually joined up the Mexicans, fought in some major battles, and unfortunately a lot of them were caught and executed. Well, that's right. But, you know, even to this day, they have parades in the honor of the San Patricios in Mexico. Yes, Mexico City, and there's a plaque there, actually. Yes. That's right. And there's been, uh, and they, I saw that last year they did it too, and there's even been several books written on the San Patricios. Yes, there has, and we will get into this a lot more next time. That's right, boy, this will be good. We might have to, you know, we might have to have a movie review too. Yeah, it's there's fascinating a, stuff. There's yes. been at least two movies on the San Patricios, and most people don't really know who they were. Really? Yes. Well, we'll have to fill them in. I think this might be a good a good way to go maybe for part two or part three of this series. I think you might be right. Will it be more tea next time? We're on, uh, there'll be all the tea you want. And it'll be, would that be Earl Grey you're after? Earl Grey? That'll work, yeah. Okay, or Bigelow? No. No, no I'll, no think, big, I'll, I'll take the Earl Grey with the whiskey. Okay, yeah. Earl Grey with uh, which kind of? Patty. Patties. Okay, Patty. we got it that done. Now, does that wrap it up? Have we covered everything Jameson you wanted to cover? too. Uh, that wraps it up for right now, Mike. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I'm sure everybody in, enjoys this, and uh, if they have any questions, I'll have them write in directly to you, especially if there are any complaints or questions about dates. All, <laughs> all complaints go to a lot of them. Well, Mick, this has been, been great. We're going to call this the Dear Mick section, and uh, we'll just uh, see what we can uncover in Irish history, and we sure appreciate any help from you in the audience. If you have some additional things to add to it, or you might help us out with the uh, what we're talking about. You just send your comments in and uh, send it in on that comment line. I'll give you that at the end of the show. And Mike, it's been great. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you, Mike. Okay, now it's back to the rest of the show.
Well, let's take a quick look at a book for the month. It's going to be a part of that set we talked about last week. This is Pinner Survey, and that's spelled P-Y-N-N-A-R-S, and it's a special census of Ireland, and in particular, Northern Ireland. And some people got it confused with Pinder. Uh, Pinder is a fellow, like, uh, I think that's spelled P-E-N-D-A-R, and uh, or something close to that, and uh It has a D in it, and that was a guy that put together the census of 1659 and and, uh, had it brought out, published uh, uh, early in the 20th century. Just keep that in mind. This is a whole separate uh, survey or census or census substitute, and some people get them confused. This is Pinner Survey, a special census of Northern Ireland, and uh, I'll have a link to that book with some illustrations on the webpage uh, on the blog. And that book is really a record of landowners. It's about 164 pages, and it was uh, set about to provide a report on each owner of land and its status. And it gives us the real names of landholders and the location and condition of their property in Ireland. And it includes counties Armagh, Tyrone, Donegal, Cavan, and Fermanagh with notes on Londonderry. And it was originally compiled as a result of the 17th century plantation of Ireland. And uh, uh, I think that'll help you out a little bit. And Pinner in that work gives us the name and the condition of the undertakers, the servitors, and the principal natives on those Ulster lands. And, of course, it's got a lot of footnotes by Hill, and they're uh, of particular interest if you're researching that time period. And... uh, Sometimes he'll bring things up to date into the 19th century even. So that's a heck of a deal. Hey, coming up, how do you think they're planning on stopping the next potato famine in Ireland? And they say the uh, uh, the fungus is coming back, folks. Or was it a bacteria? Hmm, let's see. I think we've got a link to that on our blog too. But that's coming up later in this uh, episode of this broadcast. So stay tuned. Hey, and also remember... In uh, Ireland was the 12th what when it was formed 90 years ago? I'll tell you about that in a little bit, too. Uh, But now it's time for everybody's favorite, the Magnificent Seven. Time to raise our eyes skyward, give thanks, and ask for help. Number one, new member Ned Sweeney of Central Islip, uh, New York. County Clare, Michael Kitson from Lisgurine and Bridget Delia Keene from Moen Moore. County Carey from Castle Island. Morgan McSweeney and children, daughters, and son, Maurice. Uh, Okay, and we're going to make Kitson the the name of the day, just for the heck of it. It's not one of those more famous names, but we'll see if we can dig anything up on it at all. Uh, Number two. Renewing member Michael O'Shaughnessy, thank you for renewing there, Michael, uh, of Santa Fe, New Mexico. He's searching for information on his great-grandparents, John O'Shaughnessy, who came to uh, Milform or Milford, Massachusetts in 1849. I said the same thing last year. I didn't know if that was a typo or not. Came in to came to Massachusetts in 1849, and James O'Shaughnessy, who came to Milford, uh, Massachusetts in 1848. Number three, uh, first initial K, Sheehan of Minneapolis, Minnesota, looking for links to her her father's side of the family, uh, Kavanaugh and Sheehan, especially trying to find info on Brian Sheehan from County Limerick. And I tell you, there's no scarcity of uh, Sheehan in those County Limerick records there. Uh, Number four, Dayton Metro Library of Dayton, Ohio. Your seven hardbound Irish County genealogy books have shipped. And that makes you the patron of the week. Uh, Number five, member Shirley Baker of Cocoa, Florida. Your birth index of Ireland and Kings and Queens County Ireland genealogy books have shipped. Uh, Number six, Jim Hanley of Tyrone, Pennsylvania. Your surnames of Ireland and birth index of Ireland have shipped. And number seven, Giselle Tellier of Montreal, Quebec National Archives. Your Irish family's book has shipped. And, uh, boy, that brings me back there. If any of you members are out there wondering how you can get the list of other people looking for your name, 
Uh, I had, I think it was Shirley Baker who asked me that, uh, one of our Magnificent Seven today, sent, sent me an email and said there's no place on the form when you do it by uh, uh, by email to do, to do that. So just you can just send me an email and uh, when you place an order for that free list, and uh, anytime you order any book, you can get a free list of people searching for any one, one, uh, one name, and I'll get it to you. You can just drop me an email at the same time when you send the uh, send the order, and I'll take care of it. Or if you send it by mail, you can just put it on a slip of paper in that envelope. Although things sure have changed. Almost all those orders are coming in by, uh, uh, by computer anymore right off the web page. It's really been a change over the last 25, 30 years. But that reminds me to thank you all once again because without each and every one of you members, past and present, uh, these podcasts wouldn't be possible and the books wouldn't be possible e- either. And uh, I sure hope we'll be holding on here through these uh, these stormy times. I think though we'll be able to do that, but I sure do appreciate the help. Uh, now let's move on to the Irish family name of the day. <laughs> Well, the name today is going to be Kitson, and in this particular instant, our instance, our researcher is looking for K-I-T-S-O-N, most likely. Now, there's several related spellings of the name. Sometimes that T in Kitson, K-I-T-T-S-O-N, that T is doubled, and sometimes it's spelled like kitchen, like the kitchen sink, and sometimes it comes from McCutcheon, which is M-C-C-U-T-C-H-E-O-N, so you might keep that in mind just in case it might have sprung from McCutcheon, but you never know. But that's just, just what an expert researcher would keep in the back of his mind. And uh, we found it in variant spelling groups number 1038 and 1039 in the Master Guide to the Various Spellings of Irish Family Names. Uh, now let's take a, just a brief look at uh, what we might have uh, on the, the McCutcheon or Kitchen name. From the Book of Irish Families, Great and Small, that's the master volume to our 34-volume set uh, on Irish families. Well, it says that the name of McCutcheon is taken from a branch of the Scottish clan MacDonald, and in Ulster, the name is mainly uh, of Tyrone and Antrim. And the older Scottish spelling is taken from uh, uh, the old Irish, uh, the old Scots spelling of the word with, with different spelling, like U-I-S-D-I-N, and the Irish Mac... Uh, from Mac Weston too, like M A C U I S T I N, and they say the name can also uh, might have been taken from the Scottish Christ- Christian name of Hutchin, and it's also related to the spelling of Hutchinson. Uh, and they also noted in there that the spellings of kitchen, like the kitchen sink, is also found used for <clears throat> for McCutcheon. So there's some relationships there that you want to remember when you're researching, and that's just part partly of what we found in the uh, Book of Irish Families, Great and Small. Uh, Well, let's take a quick look here at the Irish Family Coats of Arms. Uh, Now, in the Book of Arms, we see that uh, in the old first edition of the Irish Book of Arms, I put uh, arms for that family name in there on plate number 201, Uh, but I didn't include it in the newer versions of the Irish Book of Arms because there really was a lack of evidence, historical evidence, that I had in my possession to prove that it was a, a legitimate uh, coat of arms. So I left it out. I got a little more particular as, as time went on. You know, that could happen to you as you get older. Uh, now let's take one last look here. In the free master index search of Irish names, it finds the Kitson family seven times, the Kitchen family seven times, and the Cutchin or McCutcheon 22 times. And uh, let me see, we have, uh, I'll just you can get a few examples here from that search. You can pull that up on our webpage and do that for your name and see what sources uh, your name comes up in. But there's a G.L. Kitson in the families of County Kerry, Ireland. And there's a Kitson in the birth index of Ireland. And also in Irish names and surnames by the Reverend Patrick Wolfe. And there is an A.R. Kitson in the Journal of the American Irish Historical Society, as well as a Henry Hudson Kitson in uh, uh, volume 30, the same volume of that uh, journal. And lastly, let's just take this one. Uh, There's a kitchen in the families of County Donegal, Ireland. And uh, 
That just gives you an idea. There are some resources out there, and there are several different spellings, as is the case with just about every name. Now, let's move on to some uh, websites and videos of the week. Well, just to say, stay in keeping with our theme here, uh, the first website will be the Kitson Family Genealogy Forum, and that's a, a gen forum, and that link will be on the blog, or you can type that into your browser, and it'll pull it up, I'm sure. Uh, Kitson Family Genealogy Forum. And number two, uh, our, uh, our video cast of the week is on Irish coats of arms and tartans. And uh, we'll, we should have that up here shortly, uh, if not today, the day of this broadcast, by the end of the day. And that's where we talk a little bit about uh, Irish coats of arms and tartans. And you got to remember, I'll have another blog uh, up uh, uh, describing uh, that video cast, but... Uh, just let it be said, there's really no such thing as an Irish family tartan. It's all a 20th century invention, and uh, even if you get down to where the counties, the county tartans are really an invention, and so are the uh, family tartans, the Irish family tartans, the Irish county tartans, are inventions of the 20th century. Your family does not have any roots going back to tartans uh, as an Irish family. As a Scots-Irish family, of course, or as a Scottish family, of course, but as far as the Irish tradition, it's not there, never was. Don't be fooled. Don't let your ancestors roll over in their graves. Uh, well, let's take a few more notes here. I got some curious news and notes, the last section, and we'll also give you some uh, links on the blog to the pages on the web where you can read more about it. Uh, but now it's time for the curious news and notes. <laughs> Well, you know, about half of all the pay phones in Ireland are being uh, removed, and we've been following this for about a year or two. Uh, and this happens as cell phones just go off the chart, and, and it means a slow goodbye to the distinctive phone booths that you remember so well if you, if, when you took your first trip over there to Ireland. Uh, it really sort of set the country apart in a strange way. But now there are over 2,000 of these phones are being removed, and, uh, and that's because there's an 80% drop in the usage over the last five years. And why is that? That's because of cell phones. Everybody's going in a quicker and easier way. And you can read more about that in the Examiner, and I'll have a link on the blog. Number two, James Ware, or Weir, was her great-grandfather, born in Ireland. He lived in Portadown, Lurgan, and then in England. And she thinks he was lost in a shipwreck off the coast of Galway in 1891. Some people think he might have survived. I think they said he might have come to America. So there may be Dublin and American connections as well. And uh, uh, you can check that address on the, uh, on the blog. It's maryware1 at googlemail.com. Uh, number three, Declan Hayden, director of Dublin Chinese New Year Festival. You know, Dublin's so big, they can have a festival on every ethnic group in the world, I'm sure. But old Declan says that they cut back this year's festival because economic times might be getting a little tighter. And they're fo they focused on uh, affordable activities, and that included acrobats and ribbon dancing and martial arts displays. And the main carnival for the Chinese New Year this year was just held in Wolf Tone Park. Uh, number four. Aer Lingus has just been named the airline of the year. That's nice to know that the Irish National Airline is getting its uh, rewards, and it says uh, they've been doing very good in customer service. So I'm assuming that means they're not losing any bags. That's real good. And, uh, you know, there were 24 airlines that competed in this contest, and Aer Lingus uh, won, and they won it just as they also announced they sold 62,000 seats online, setting a record in one day. Uh, you can read that about, about that in the Herald, and uh, I'll have a link to that on our blog. And number five, you know that potato famine means a lot to everybody who's Irish. They heard the stories, at least in the last generation, those stories were always passed down. And reports give the worst cases of the potato blight hitting Ireland in the last few years. And it's a new deadly strain they're worried about. The spores can remain alive in the soil for four years. And they're talking about the solution being genetically modified potatoes as a result. 
ones that won't get the blight. Uh, just think if they had modified potatoes during the Great Famine, uh, millions of us would still be in Ireland and would never have uh, spread across the world like we've had. But then there would have been a million more Irishmen alive, so that would have been a good thing. Uh, but as a result, we did get forced abroad after that first famine. But let's hope they can avoid problems with that potato crop again and uh, see what happens with that genetically modified potato. Number six, when the first Irish government sat some 90 years ago in Ireland, it was only one of 12 democracies in the entire world. So uh, that's an accomplishment in itself, and it makes you makes you really appreciate uh, what democracies really are and understand that uh, the whole world is not a democracy and does not have to stay that way. So I'm in favor of keeping those democracies in full force. Uh, that'll do it for the day. Remember to send your comments by clicking the contact link on our webpage at irishroots.com or send by mail to our American address, the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave your message or report on things in your part of the world when you call my phone recorder at 816-256-3360 or you can Skype me at Irish Roots Cafe. Members foot the bill so they get first priority, but we're open to all. And by the way, a big thank you to all of our members. And away. Away.